that, 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 that don't kill me can only make me stronger. I need you to hurry up now, cause I can't wait much longer. I know I got to be right now, cause I can't get much stronger. <sighs> Best entrance music I've yeah. ever come out to. I feel like you just upped the game for everybody <laughs> else's entrance music tomorrow. I'll take it. But <laughs> cool. So we're, I'm so excited that you're here. I think we're going to kind of have a good chat. I, I'd love to start with just, a, I mean, uh, how many people here know what Bevel is, Walker and Company's first, or Walker and Brand's first mm -hmm. brand? Mm -hmm. um, and how many people are sort of familiar with it? How many people have used it? Awesome. I like okay, good. So, so it's a good place to start. I mean, I think every, a lot of people know about your personal story. Um, a lot of people know sort of where you came from, but where did kind of the idea for Bevel originate? And I believe it was at age 15. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so for, for 15 years of my life, I was in, unable to shave, right? Uh, and that was a function of my having kind of coarse, curly hair, right? Every single way that I, I encountered facial hair removal sucked, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, the first way I encountered it was using kind of a multi-blade razor, right? Uh, couldn't use that because it cuts hair beneath your skin. If you have curly hair, it's going to grow in your skin and you're just going to break out and look crazy, right? Uh, the, the second way I encountered facial hair removal, you go to your barber. Your barber is using the same electric trimmers he's using on everyone else's face, uh, on your face, which is kind of disgusting when you think about it. Uh, it doesn't cut very close, et cetera. Uh, and then for 14 years of my life, I did the worst thing of them all. I put a depilatory cream on my face, right? Uh, so these are these things that have all these hazardous, harsh chemicals. You know, you think about things like Nair, that sort of thing. I like put this stuff on my face, <laughs> right? Uh, it burns your face, discolors your skin, et cetera. Uh, so I just got fed up uh, and felt that there had to be a better way, and that set us on this path to build Bevel, which is really the first uh, and only shaving system designed specifically for, for men and women with coarse and curly hair. And I, I think what's especially interesting, we're talking so much about content and commerce, and I think um, you've really sort of hit that nail on the head. And Thank you. when it comes to CPG especially, I think, um, the trust part is really important. I mean, again, you're talking about something you're putting on your face. You're talking yeah. about something you're putting on your body. Um, kind of how important was that whole trusting when you started thinking about it, when you started thinking about the, the content you were going to create, how you were going to put it on the site, um, and how did that manifest itself, and what do you have now? When it yeah, so, so there are a couple ways to kind of unpack this a little bit, right? So the first is the impetus behind kind of our starting Walker and Company, right? Uh, it really started out of two views of the world that I had that I think few people in Silicon Valley understand. Uh, the first view of the world really pertains to culture, right? I fundamentally have this belief that all global culture is led by American culture, which is led by black culture in the U.S. Uh, when you think about food, music, dance, et cetera, and more recently, Latino and Asian culture. And the big frustration of mine was my living in the earliest adopting region in the world, uh, and it's knowing very little about the earliest adopting culture, right? Like, that discord doesn't make much sense to me. Uh, and the second view of the world that I had pertained to health and beauty CPG companies. Uh, but specifically, you know, my experience of going to, uh, you know, a CVS or any C-store retailer, uh, having to go to aisle 14, right, it's the ethnic aisle, uh, but it's not really an aisle because it's a shelf. Uh, then after reaching the bottom of that shelf for a package that's dirty, uh, and then there's a photo of it uh, on a, of a gentleman who's like 65 years old uh, with jerry curls and a velvet robe, petting a cat, drinking a cognac, right, and they assume that I should buy that product. Like that entire second class citizen experience just needs to go. Uh, so we put those two views of the world together to build a very special CPG company focused uniquely on the needs of people of color. Now, uh, as it pertains to Bevel, you know, what's really important to understand is that a lot of our customers are shaving for either the first time uh, or the second time, right? Because the first time that they shaved, they used some of these mass marketed products which didn't work, right? Uh, so kind of we're swimming upstream uh, with skepticism, <laughs> right? Uh, and the thing that we've been able to prove uh, is that we've delivered on a product that's actually clinically proven to work, uh, a product that's driven a lot of word of mouth uh, to get people excited about it. Uh, and that word of mouth actually kind of delivers on uh, some of the content that we serve to our customers, and it served us quite well. Uh, and the last part, and shut me up, because I can talk about this stuff all day. Um, we launched uh, the Bevel brand, uh, started taking pre-orders for it in December of 2013, started shipping in February of 2014. Six months before that, uh, we launched a portal called Bevel Code, bevelcode.com. It's the first kind of digital magazine focused on styling and grooming for men of color. Uh, and Walker and Company is all about kind of delivering brands that solve problems, right? And we saw one problem, and, and that problem was if I wanted to go online to find information around what moisturizer to use for my skin, I can't find that anywhere, right? I can't find that on GQ, can't find that in Esquire, anywhere, right? And that's a shame. Um, so we developed uh, kind of Bevel Code to really deliver 
uh, on that promise, right? Uh, de de develop really great content uh, related to styling and grooming, speak to influencers about their grooming habits and routines, uh, and really without doing anything else, um, just that portal alone contributes to a good portion of our sales. And we don't even direct people to our main site uh, from it prominently. People just find uh, the Bevel product uh, through their reading that site, which is interesting. Well, that's, I think that brings us to something sort of that we're talking about a lot. The, you know, the, the uh, brands are becoming publishers and platforms are becoming publishers and agencies are becoming platforms. And that, that sort of hit the nail on the head. The GQ didn't have the information that we go to GQ to mm -hmm. find. Um, what, is the dif what are the difficulties with that? I mean, people look, for pu look to publishers for certain things. There's, an, there's a trust issue there. There's an honesty issue there. How do you get people to trust you? Because you know, isn't there some sense of, well, he's trying to push his product on me? That's the whole point. Yeah, well, I mean, you come to our, our website, Bevel Code, you really cannot find getbevel.com anywhere. Like, it's actually very, very hard to find. Uh, and for us, it just started with solving a problem, right? Uh, it wasn't about building that to actually drive sales. It was to solve a problem uh, and do it with really great authenticity, right? You go to the website, you can read an article uh, from Nas, the hip-hop artist, around kind of where he got his half-moon part from, the origin of that, right? Really compelling content that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, we spoke to the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity at Stanford University, oldest fraternity, uh, black fraternity in the country, about what it's like to live on a campus without a barbershop within five miles of it, right? Like, this is content that really needs to exist, uh, and we're delivering on that in a truly authentic way, uh, which I think has really separated us from a lot of the larger incumbents out there. But then how do you, then, then on the other side, how do you sort of get make sure that the content portal isn't just a content portal, it is sort of, a part of your brand, it's a voice of your brand, and like you said, it's driving some of those sales. I mean, how do you all retain sort of, what I'm asking, I guess, is retaining that balance is really hard. Right? Well, you know, I, I think we think about it, um, you know, the, the irony is that we think about them as very separate entities, right? Mm -hmm. um, so when we think about getbevel.com, the portal where you can actually buy our shaving product, that's about the science, right? Uh, we have a clinically proven product, well-designed, great customer service, et cetera. Bevel code is just about great content that people want to consume, right? Uh, there are folks in the demographic that we want to serve that are just never going to shave their faces, right? They're just going to take beards or keep their beards forever, right? Um, but there's content we can deliver to them that's of benefit to them that, again, the GQs and Esquires just aren't serving. Uh, and, you know, that's the benefit of, I guess, being a venture-funded business is that we can separate them and actually allocate resources towards making those things great. Uh, once we do that, uh, then we can work on kind of like cross-promoting uh, both, um, but we don't have to do that right now. Then where, so where, where kind of are you promoting it? I mean, you said um, a lot of people that are your customers are first time shavers or yep. second time shavers, right? So where does, how, if you're not actively pushing that content, if you're not pushing bevel code at them, um, how do you get it to them? How do you sort of, what are your different channels? What's your preferred channel? Yeah, so I mean, my preferred channel is just word of mouth. Um, you know, the great thing I think that we, we've had is we've delivered on a product that just works, right? Uh, you know, you gotta really think about this for a second. You know, if I use a multi-blade razor when I'm 15, break out the following morning, I've written off razors for the rest of my life. And when I finally have something that works, I'm willing to talk about it. I'll give you guys a, a couple examples. Uh, over the past few months, I've gotten a few emails from customers, right? Uh, to really show that we're working on something pretty special. I got an email from a woman who said, Tristan, uh, thank you for finally having a product to teach single moms how to teach their sons how to shave, right? You know, that's my story and kind of almost made me want to cry. There's another gentleman uh, who was in the Army, right? In the Army, you have to shave every day, right? And he said, Tristan, for as long as I could remember, uh, issues related to razor bump shaving irritation have been as big a part of my military career as my uniform, wow. <laughs> right? And there's another gentleman uh, who said, Tristan, for 15 years, I've been donning a beard to work, right? Out of fear of using some of the mass marketed products that exist out there. And I feel like it's limited my career advancement, <laughs> right? Thank you for finally having a product that works. So when you think about uh, kind of the preferred channel of promotion, mm -hmm. like that word of mouth alone uh, has really served us quite well. Uh, and I think we'll continue to because the, the, the level of how profound um, what we've been able to build like is, it's actually fairly significant. And I, I don't think people give it enough credit. What about, so if somebody's sort of sending you these, um, and I noticed you actually retweeted a, a, a one this morning that mm -hmm. was really sort of touching. It was this long paragraph. Um, that Amanda sort of really was thanking you mm -hmm. for it. Do you do you want to turn that into content? Do you want to turn that into sort of a brand message? Um, yeah. So that's a perfect example. You know, there's a gentleman who, um, you know, he wasn't able to shave for 20 years, right? Uh, and he said, "All right, well, I have a lot of other friends who are just skeptical around using razor products. 
let me just invite them to my home. Uh, you know, we're going to go through this experience together. We're going to document it. We're going to take beautiful photos. Uh, you know, and one thing that happened was, you know, they enjoyed the experience. Uh, and you had these special moments where their sons would walk into the bathroom and have this kind of like this, it was such a beautiful moment where he just looked at his father and was like, wow, what is that? Like, what is that? Uh, and you, you start to think about how important that rite of passage is. Uh, and for the customers that we're serving, a lot of us just don't have that, right? Like, I didn't have a father to teach me how to shave the right way, right? Uh, but to enable that for a lot of folks is pretty profound. So he wrote this uh, you know, really long post around you know, how much he admired that uh, and took these beautiful photos. And now we're going to do kind of some more deep uh, kind of content with him around that experience in particular. Um, but that's not unique to him because we get that a lot. So a lot of real stories. There. Absolutely. You're using a lot of those. Absolutely. Um, what about like scaling that? I mean, what's sort of the next step when it comes to content? I mean, you're you're still you're a small company. Yeah. What, what's when when you have two brands, three brands, five different products out there? Um, how do you scale like that authentic? Like this is this is who I am. This is my personal story is a, is a big part of it. Um, how do you make that bigger? So um, the first question, or not question, the first comment that I have is that, um, or well, I guess it's a question comment. Um, do we have to, <laughs> right? You know, one thing, I'm of like the Dunhumby school of kind of loyalty, I suppose, uh, where, you know, they say, you know, retained customers are actually more profitable than acquired ones, right? For the past 14, or for the past, I guess, 12 or so months, we've just focused on building a product that people love, mm -hmm. right? That's the only thing that matters. You know, mo we have a subscription plan. Most, uh, the overwhelming majority of our customers stick with us. Um, and that's what we wanted to focus on, right? Uh, and if we do that quite well, you know, we can grow slowly uh, and do it in a sustainable way, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and the word of mouth will just pick up on itself, right? Uh, so, you know, I kind of push back when a lot of folks ask us, you know, how do we scale? I always say, like, do we have to, right? Uh, you know, if we can build a, a business that's profitable, if we can build something that people love, you know, the score will take care of itself. Yeah. yeah, and again, coming back to a small company, I mean, we talked a lot about, um, earlier today, we sort of had a little town hall, and we talked a lot about internal challenges. Um, and of course, if you have a company of, you know, 1,000, 2,000 people, those challenges are very different, um, as I'm sure you experienced yeah. in your previous yeah. life. Uh, what, you know, how was your experience or that Foursquare, how did some of that sort of Silicon Valley teachings or um, kind of apply themselves here? Because it's very different. I mean, it's very different to build a CPG brand in a world where everyone's out there sort of making, hey, another way to communicate. Yeah, Let's build sure. a new messaging app. Yeah. You know? Well, so, um, you know, a lot, so my background, before I started Walker and Company, um, you know, I was one of the early folks at a small company at the time called Foursquare. Uh, I led business development for them, and it was a really great time. And a lot of folks asked me, well, how do you go from Foursquare to building a health and beauty CPG company? Uh, and I like to tell folks that it's really no different, right? At Foursquare, we worked on solving a problem that folks had, and we did it with a brand that was unique, that people loved, right? Uh, the only difference with Foursquare in this is that we were selling a, a product that was digital. Now it's a little bit more analog, right? And that's fine. Um, so, you know, when I think about, um, you know, like our future and uh, kind of where we want to go, you know, Foursquare, what we learned, I remember the second South by Southwest that we attended, we were only five employees, right? And folks thought we were a team of 50 plus, right? We accomplished a lot with a little. When I started Walker and Company, you know, I had no prior experience in health and beauty CPG. We raised money in June of 2013. Six months later, we started taking orders for it, right? This is a six product consumer line built from scratch in six months. Knowing what we know now, we can do it in half the cost and half the time, and we did it with five people, right? Uh, now we're 18. Right, which means that I think we can do some more damage. But the one thing that I learned, at least in Silicon Valley, is that you can do a lot with a little, right? Uh, and especially, you can do a hell of a lot uh, with folks that might not have had that prior experience because it, it forces us to beg very many questions that a lot of the larger incumbents might not. Yeah. What about then the internal challenges? I mean, if you've got if you've, you've got 18 people now, um, sort of what what are the sort of the systemic, the process, like? How do you kind of get them to understand what you're trying to say? Like, your vision is clearly, it's very clear to you. Mm -hmm. It's hard to translate. It's hard to communicate that. And as you get bigger, it's going to get harder, right? Yeah, so there, there are a couple of things that we do, I think, um, to combat that. Uh, number one, uh, you know, everybody has memorized the mission of the company internally. Like, that's something that we force, right? Like, I take that very, very seriously. Uh, anyone can challenge anyone to articulate the mission, and if you get it wrong, you owe that other person $3. There's like, mm -hmm. there's stuff like that that we do that I think has served us quite well in, in that stead. Uh, additionally, every six months, I do a kind of um, a strategic plan for the next six to 12 months, right? 
and it's based off this concept of a flywheel. It's something that Jeff Bezos does at, at Amazon. Uh, and you know, he looked at this, I think it was you know, probably a decade or so ago, uh, you know, flywheel, it spins and has all this inertia. The more it spins, the faster it spins, the harder it is to stop. Uh, and they started with kind of customer satisfaction. That customer satisfaction, if you get customers who are happy, you'll get more traffic to your site. If you get more traffic to your site, you'll get more third party sellers to sell on the platform. If you get more third party sellers to sell on the platform, uh, you're gonna get greater selection, which actually leads to greater customer satisfaction, right? So it gets this kind of flywheel going and allows them to pass through lower cost to customers, which adds in the customer satisfaction. If you look at Amazon versus kind of Walmart over the past 10 plus years, uh, you know, that's a big reason why I think Amazon has succeeded so well. Uh, when we think about Walker and Company, you know, for us it starts with customer satisfaction, right? We want to deliver on a promise of a product that works with a customer experience that's second to none. Uh, if we do that, uh, it really drives the word of mouth, right? Uh, with greater word of mouth, we get greater traffic. With greater traffic, we get retailers like yourselves who want to kind of distribute the product. Uh, which just means more bevel or more brands in more places, which aids in the customer satisfaction. Uh, the reason I say all this stuff is because every six months, uh, we focus on certain rungs of that flywheel, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so for the past year, it was customer satisfaction uh, and word of mouth and reinvestment. So thinking about new brands and that sort of thing. Uh, you know, now this year, or at least over the next six months, we're thinking very much about word of mouth traffic distribution, right? And some more reinvestment. So you know, we do that every six months, and I make sure to check in um, and have kind of performance metrics tied to each every week. That distribution part is interesting, because I think, uh, yes, it's good for you, and it's good for your cu customers. Of course, there's more of it available mm -hmm. to more people. Um, at the same time, the bigger you get, the more places that carry your product, the fewer people are coming to it through getbevel.com, mm -hmm. fewer people are maybe happening on Bevel code. Um, so that content part of it is very hard to sustain the wider your distribution network gets. How do you deal with that? Well, I, I disagree with that. It depends on the type of distribution you have, right? So um, you know, one of our investors advises Ron Johnson, who actually started and ran Apple Retail for a while, and JCPenney. Uh, and he said something that stuck with me for a long time. He said, Tristan, the reason Apple Retail won is because they optimized the experience for the 99% of people who didn't buy anything, right? Like you go to Apple, you can listen to music, you can check your email, uh, your kid can play on a Mac, right? Uh, so when I think about what we're trying to do for Bevel or any brand that we launch, how do we optimize an experience for the 99% of people who might not want a haircut, right? Or a salon treatment or something of the sort, right? So delivering an experience uh, that folks care about to help them learn a little bit more about the brand. And our content could be re really fed through that experience in, in untold ways. So your content is the, is the Apple Store? Uh, theoretically. Yeah. Theoret theoretically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just talk really quickly about metrics um, when it comes to content. I mean, how do you see what does well? How do you kind of know what to push up? Um, it's, a, it's, it's a thing publishers deal with most yeah, often, yeah. but you are, for all intents and purposes, a yeah, publisher. Yeah. Well, um, right now, in, in terms of metrics for Bevel Code, yeah. uh, we're just trying to ask our customers what they want to see, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the fortunate thing about things like Twitter and Facebook, et cetera, is that we get that real-time feedback immediately, right? Now, clearly, there are the things like, all right, well, the page views, the conversions off those page views to actually buy our product and all that stuff. But, but again, we think about Bevel Code as really a separate entity. Okay. Uh, particularly, you know, the, the, the kind of more important metrics for us is, you know, how do we get getbevel.com, where we actually sell our product, uh, to not only grow but also just make us profitable, uh, which will allow us to reinvest those profits back into things like Bevel Code and other products, et cetera. Um, so from a content perspective, you know, I think that's more anecdotal than anything, at least in the interim, mm -hmm. uh, until we kind of scale the business side of the business. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, we have just like a minute and a half for questions, if there are any. Any this questions? One over there, this one right over here. Is the microphone right here? to separate Bevel and Bevel Code? You could just do separate websites. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so when people come to Bevel, uh, getbevel.com, where our actual product is, um, they care about a couple things. Number one, um, well, one thing, does this product work, <laughs> right? Uh, we want to get out of their way, right? So we want to show them, you know, we have a dermatologist who's a resident uh, with us. Uh, here's the result of our clinical tests and clinical trials. It's proven to work. Here are the ingredients, here's why it works. For us to start floating a kind of an article about Nas and where he got his half moon part from, that's gonna preclude people from kind of learning what they wanna learn about, right? 
uh, in order to buy the product. So we want to get out of the way, right? Uh, and for Bevel Code, again, uh, there are Get Bevel customers who read Bevel Code content, and there are non Get Bevel customers who read Bevel Code content. Uh, so when I think about Bevel Code, I think about uh, leveraging that as a way to show the aesthetic of the brand, the tone of the voice of the brand, uh, and when I think about getbevel.com, it's purely science. Thank you. Yeah. Um, anybody else? Sorry, let's see. Cool. Oh, there's right. one here. There's a couple. A couple here. Elaine is on her Whoa. way. <laughs> She's taking a long route. <laughs> Hey, how's it going? Uh, Adam Kleinberg from Traction. Um, so I've got a client who's a CPG. It's in kind of pet care, right? But like it's an organic product and uh, it's launched about a year ago. And the client's struggling, his brand is struggling with authenticity. He's hearing from re retailers. They haven't really broken that. And I, I want to push them toward, toward more of a content model to establish that. Um, I mean, you, you come from Foursquare, right? You, you get it, right? But like, how do I articulate and, and establish someone who's really concerned with ROI, who's uh, you know, new at being a CEO and a, and a CPG? Like, are you using metrics to say, here's the ROI of uh, like Marketo or something to tie in like, here's the metrics that show that this content is working? Or how do you make that case to, uh, yeah, no, that's a great question. Point. I mean, I thought a lot about this when I was at Foursquare, and I tried to get these guys to understand this. So, so I mentioned Dunhumby, right, out of Cincinnati. These guys um, are super well known for helping like Kroger, Macy's, all these other retailers really drive at what loyalty really means. Uh, and what I got out of uh, n not only my chats with Dunhumby, but doing a lot of kind of reading with them is like what loyalty is, right? Uh, and a lot of folks just really don't understand that. And the way that they explain it is, is that it's all about recency, frequency, value, right, and finding the kind of 80-20 there, or 2080, um, and then communicating with kind of the 20% of people that drive the large majority of profit. Uh, kind of what I've learned with a lot of um, retailers is that they're really only committed um, to developing things for mass, right, and not niche, right? So the first thing I always say is like, who are the 20% of people that are so diehard about your brand? And you know, you can get the ROI out of that. Right? There are companies like Dunhumby and others that can actually drive that, and if you're an e-commerce player, it's a lot easier to even find that stuff. Um, that's where it starts, um, because that's where the authenticity, that's where the stories are, et cetera. Uh, and if they're not doing that, and, and also only relying on their retailers to tell them that, then that's step one of the problem. Okay. Cool. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank cool. you so much. Thank you, guys. Okay. Appreciate it. Excellent. Thank you, Tristan. Thank you, Shireen. Appreciate it.